spoken lately. I haven't thought about flying for a long time. I haven't dreamed of that moment when I was alone above the clouds for a long time. I have dreamed of waking up in a room surrounded in blue and green grass for more years than I could dream of memory. I haven't walked back into the past or scratched on the doors of my origins, where it all came from, since I held up that cape for the last time. Return to Kent Town 10th year anniversary edition is a revised version of Andy Ern's first poetry book. The book can be purchased from Amazon and it contains numerous additional material. Spoken Label Hi, it's Andy Ern from Spoken Label. Thank you today for streaming or downloading another episode of Spoken Label. Spoken Label was originally set up on beginning of 2016 and as of speaking has currently nearly 300 sessions. The full archive is available on Spoken Label full stop bandcamp.com although it is available for free for stream and download if you wish I am always grateful for any sort of kind of donation to enable me to keep the running costs of this podcast going. And enjoy. Take care. Bye-bye. Spoken Label. Hi, guys. Andy and Spoken Label. Back in the house on a Sunday evening. Yes, okay, this is a very, very unusual podcast today, but one that I really wanted to get out there to you. With the way Spoken Label often runs, I often take bookings usually a couple of months in advance, And if you know the way I run this podcast, you would also know I I don't do any recordings in August. It's not like some downtime, basically. And so what does happen is, I often, when I tag it this time of year, I do get some booking requests coming towards the end of July. And I can't do them because I'm taking a break now. This is what's happened here with this case. Now, I was due to speak to a lady called Annie O'Neill Steen. Now, I heard from her agent back in, if memory's correct, it was July, July territory, about getting Annie on Spoken Label to speak to her about her wonderful debut novel, Exit Wounds. And we actually had this pencil in roughly for about the beginning of October. Unfortunately, Annie sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago, as I can understand. So obviously, I'm not going to be able to chat to her about this book. But after chatting to her agent, Nadi, we both agreed to carry on with this podcast anyway by getting one of her friends, Susan Blakely, to read out several chapters of this book. Susan's kindly recorded this and it's been sent across by Nadi and it's absolutely phenomenal. Really, really, really powerful stuff. I'll read out the blurb of the book to you because there's a lot I could add about this but I want you to really read the notes on this because I've put a lot of notes with this podcast. Born to Shanty Irish on one side and Park Avenue privilege on the other. Laura navigates a turbulent childhood filled with the alcohol fueled abuse of a volatile father and a mother's excessive drinking. As the middle child of three girls, she assigns herself the role of a mother's protector who dies. When Laura is 13, leaving the heart broken and drift. Insecure, anxious and fearful, she tries drugs, random sex, and a sequence of lovers. Along the way, she becomes a successful painter and has a bad first marriage. Nothing, however, seems to assure her emptiness and a sense of loss. Eventually, she marries a caring man and has a loving daughter. It is only at the end of her life, and by way of an unusual, unexpected turn of events, she is finally able to make peace of herself and let go of the feeling she never really grieved, and said goodbye to her beloved mother, and to appreciate though we work at love and acceptance, sometimes the most wonderful experience in our life come in unanticipated and unsought ways. Annie O'Neill Steen has an engaging voice, quirky, funny, full of original observations and expressions as she adroitly explores the mystery of the human heart. Like I said, if you look at the notes on this podcast, a lot of praise coming in this book, obviously, before it got published. And I don't doubt she would have been a fascinating guest. Unfortunately, this is not meant to be in his lifetime, so 
we'll have to make do with what we've got, but these are these really are good recordings and it is an exceptional book. Take care guys. Andy N signing out. Spoken mate. It's the not saying goodbye that can kill you. Not quickly, which could be merciful, but so slowly one doesn't even know it's happening. Before a loved one dies, saying goodbye, making peace, speaking one's heart to the dying beloved, allows one to move forward, to be released and to release, for forgiveness to occur. If that doesn't happen, one's heart could unknowingly be in a state of arrested development. In a word, fucked. One's heart could be fucked. Decisions will be made. Diseases will be invited in. Melancholy and moodiness will follow for the rest of one's days. Such was the case with Laura. Spoken later. Chapter 1. The Half-Assed Brother Why did the man cut the toilet seat in half? Laura's father asked when he'd stopped tickling her. She was laughing so hard she was almost crying. When the commercial for Rice Krispies, Snack Crackle and Pop interrupted Howdy Doody and Buffalo Bob, the human slob, her father, had launched a sneak tickle attack. He stopped when he nearly fell off the bed, not because she begged him to. I don't know, she answered hiccuping, her white flannel pajamas with the pink jumping cows, her favorites falling down. Yanking the bottoms back up while raking a wad of grown out bangs back, she said again, I don't know, Daddy, why? Because his half-assed brother was coming to town, said her dad, delighted at himself, followed by a, now dare you go, in his put-on Irish accent, picking her up, facing her toward the TV. Howdy was back, saying, howdy, kids. So she turned her attention to the black and white television set on top of the mahogany trunk at the foot of her parents' bed, saving herself from showing him that she didn't get the joke. The trunk held extra linens, several wool blankets, and a stack of her mother's neatly folded satin bed jackets in a see-through plastic bag that leaked the scent of mothballs. No one ever wanted to disturb the precious television set by going for another blanket on a cold night. As a family, they held the set in great esteem. Lassie was in there, and Arthur Godfrey. For Laura and her dad, it was their boundary, their fourth wall their chaperone, and an intricate part of their Saturday mornings. When she turned her attention back to Howdy and Buffalo Bob, her dad took up his newspaper, the night before his New York Herald Tribune, or the Wall Street Journal from earlier in the week. He read while she watched. That was the sublime time, although she didn't know it then, as we never do, nor did she know the word to describe it. Her mother may have been having her hair done in the village, for a while, she had a standing 8.30 Saturday morning appointment with Sal, the owner of the only hair salon in their town. He was tall, handsome, and charmingly Italian, her mom would tease him. Tell me again why you were banished to the Isle of Station Wagons. It's time we both went back to the land of crazy cabbies before the quiet out here buries us both, Sal would say. Working the tail of his teasing comb through her hair, they'd be off comparing the things they missed back in the city. Schraff's coffee ice cream for her, any bakery in Little Italy for him. If her parents were enjoying a good spell, a sober, healthy spell, her mother could have been downstairs making pancakes, scrambling eggs, and frying up perfectly crisp bacon. She may have been wrestling Aunt Jemima maple syrup out of Peggy's hands before she drank it all up like milk. Peggy must have been around three then, as Laura was six when she and her father were in love. He was long, lean, and prematurely gray, her dad, with thinning hair cut short at the sides and brushed back, just a little longer than his marine haircut, with blue eyes, ice blue, and sharp features. His mouth and eyes looked in cahoots, like they were always laughing. He was handsome, like the actor Lee Marvin, famous for playing Marines in the 50s and 60s, only gentler looking, unless he was drunk past the line of pleasant, heading into cruel. But on Saturday mornings, for a while there, none of that unattractiveness reared its ugly head. He was all hers for a couple of undisturbed hours, making Laura 
one heck of a happy daddy's girl. Laura hadn't a clue where Lucy was on those Saturday mornings. She didn't care about either of her sister's whereabouts during those sessions, if they weren't anywhere near her parents' bedroom. I'm going to give you the business, her dad would say when she'd climb up on his chest and hold the neck of his undershirt. Feeling the cotton warm and worn between her chubby little fingers, she'd hoist it up to her nose and sniff it, inhaling her daddy. I'm giving you the business, young lady, he'd tell her again, diving full on into her neck, making nuzzling sounds. An insect fiesta, a bee bumbling, a buzzing fly diving into her neck while his hand spider danced over her back and belly. He may have been his truest, least guarded self on those mornings, his freest without the drink. No reason not to be free when all that's coming straight at you is love, pure love, wanting only to stick to you like a second skin. Things must have been going well at home. Maybe he was selling a lot, going from door to door, smiling, tipping his hat for the Fuller Brush Company. Maybe it was later, after her grandpa Curry bought him his seat on the New York Stock Exchange. He was feeling semi-buoyant about himself then for sure. Whatever the reason, it was a healthier, happier, better period than those to come. The late 50s in suburban New York wasn't exactly the time of innocence and wonder people wanted it to be. But they smiled in their plaid short sleeve shirts, mowed their lawns and tipped their hats to their neighbors. When the Saturday morning snuggle fests in her parents' bed ended, her father replaced them with Saturday afternoons at Rudy's bar. Grown-up stuff. Sporting his khaki trousers and a tweed jacket, he did what, culturally, came naturally to him. Irish men by tradition spent at least two hours of their Saturday afternoons in the pub. Rudy's, the only freestanding watering hole in Sands Point, did a brisk business on Saturdays. All the mix came out of the woodwork thirsty. Firemen, policemen, plumbers were your usual suspects. Lawyers, doctors, insurance brokers wearing sports jackets. A priest or two in a black cardigan also constituted a typical Saturday afternoon, with elbows pressed to the polished wood at Rudy's. What do you say, Michael Tool? And who might this young filly beside you be? Rudy asked jovially as they strolled through the door with the sun framing them briefly in a bright yellow haze. Howdy, Rudy, me boy, responded Laura's dad, putting a hand on her shoulder, directing her toward the partially occupied row of maroon leather bar stools. The stools they landed on that first trip became their stools. Picking her up, swinging her in the air, around to the left, then around to the right, giving her a good whiff of his brown houndstooth sports jacket, wet wool mothballs from the hall closet, and his old spice aftershave. He plopped her atop the stool. This is my partner in crime, Rudy, he said. My middle girl, my little Laura. That became her handle at Rudy's. She'd walk in the door and get greeted by the proprietor first, and then the regulars as little Laura. Oh, and how she loved it. How grown up it made her feel to strut her blue jean self with her bobbed haircut and white keds, strut into that smoke clouded semi dark den and be called by her very own nickname. Have her Shirley Temple waiting by a bowl of peanuts in front of her regular place at the bar. Rudy and the others didn't know Lucy and how pretty she was or Peggy with her button nose and cute lisp. No, her new friends didn't even know they existed, which was fine with her. Laura, with her round face, just a backdrop for a million freckles, felt she couldn't compete with either pretty or cute. So a nickname in a bar was a gift. Laura felt guilty about playing both sides of the fence for a while. She and her dad were supposed to be doing errands on Saturdays, the dry cleaners to pick up his suits, grocery shopping at the A&P, the library to pick up a book for her mother. On their way out the door, her mother always asked her to be a good girl now and keep an eye on your father. No fool, Margaret O'Toole. Her mother thought Laura was her sole sidekick and relied on her more than her other two daughters. But her mother was completely in the dark about her activities with her dad. She would assure her mother she would, keeping her eyes to the ground. 
She didn't think of it as lying, omitting was what it was, but she saw it as leaving that part out. Her mother's question when they got home was always, was your father good or did your father behave himself? She always told the truth because he was indeed good to her and everyone else at Rudy's where he behaved very well. He was funny and made her laugh, made several of the men laugh, including Mr. O'Hara, Sean O'Hara, the father of the fat boy in her class, and Sergeant Sullivan, whose wife waved the school kids across the street at the light in front of George's luncheonette. Her dad had them all in stitches. Oh, go on, Mike. You're a real card, you are, said Mr. O'Hara. <laughs> he is indeed, agreed Rudy, drying a glass with a rag behind the bar, the burly white-haired character of an Irish barkeep shaking off the last of his laugh. Little Laura, he'd say, turning to her, can I top off your Shirley for you? Another cherry, perhaps? Your old man's a real pistol, missy. Her father was a card and a pistol at Rudy's, so she determined that qualified as well-behaved. The only reason she didn't feel too guilty about straddling both sides of the fence was that she told herself it would be handing her parents another reason to ruckus. Their list was long enough. At six, she was no fool either. Behind the bar at Rudy's, parked in front of the mirror that lined the wall from floor to ceiling, sat a beautiful model ship. It was handmade of a dark wood and every intricate piece of it was delicate, beautiful and fascinating to Laura, who had never seen one like it. After a few Saturdays asking Rudy about the ship, he began to take it down and put it near her place alongside her Shirley. She'd seen him taking it from behind the bar when he saw them coming in. Rudy took excellent care of that boat. It never had a speck of dust on it. He loved all kinds of boats and could rattle off the names of famous seafaring vessels from all over the world till you'd drop your head in the crook of your arm flat down on the bar. Snoring from boring was how the regulars joked about it. Some of the men ribbed him, saying things to Rudy like, you buying it for your retirement, Captain? But she and Rudy shared an affinity for that model ship. Laura could sit for hours studying every detail of it. Rudy told her that he built it in 646 consecutive days. He said it was a long time ago when he needed a project to come home to 646 days in a row. That he was a different man when he finished from who he was when he started. See how I customized the part hole? Rudy pointed out to her one Saturday afternoon while her father was holding forth on the merits of owning a Mercury, especially the station wagons. She was in their clubhouse Ships, cars, half-assed brothers come into town. The outings to Rudy's lasted several months. Being the only child on those afternoons didn't bother her a bit. She knew she didn't belong there, just as she knew it wasn't appropriate for her to be running into the Sands Point liquor locker to get her mother a fifth of beef eater gin on the way home from school. But so far, neither outing had harmed anyone. Again, it was her special time with her dad. She loved the way he looked in his sports coat and smelled of aftershave and was a real card. She could tell he was proud of her in front of Rudy and his bar friends. She couldn't imagine him sharing Rudy's with either of her two sisters. He never had to ask her not to discuss their outings with either one of them. She was born a savvy accomplice. He never got out of line there. He had a drink or two and nurse those for as long as he could, for as much time as he could steal. Laura's time at Rudy's laid the foundation for her lifelong proclivity toward illicit acts and clandestine hideaways. Who knows how long they could have had at Rudy's. If cartoons in bed turned into cocktails at two, late suppers could have been close at hand had her father not fucked it up. The last time they went there as a couple, when she wasn't sent in to fetch him by her fuming mother waiting out in the car, was the day after she saw him give her mother a black eye. They didn't walk in as the happy couple or the giggling partners in crime that Saturday. The only reason she was even with him was because of the A.M.P. errand front. She told her mother earlier that morning that she hated her father and wanted nothing to do with him, that if she were smart, she'd divorce him. 
But her mother insisted she go and help with the marketing. She was told to keep both eyes on him. Her mother wore black sunglasses to hide the jellyfish-shaped bruise that bled purple down her left cheek past the rim of her glasses. Laura followed the shades of purple as her mom spoke. The night before, she had begged and pleaded that he unclench his fist and not punch her mother. Things had gone badly from the get-go that night. She and Lucy were playing seven-card rummy in the back seat of the car parked in the train station lot, waiting for the 525 from Penn Station to pull in. Elvis was singing Don't Be Cruel on the radio. It was autumn and already dark and chilly. They hadn't changed out of their school uniforms and just had light sweaters over their jumpers. Their mom was smoking so her window was down, letting in the cool evening air and the fall smells Laura loved. Wood burning from neighboring fireplaces, wool sweaters, leaves going from pungent green to decaying red. The smell of grilling meat and roasting garlic from Peter's Grill across the station made her hungry. I won, Laura said, putting her cards down on the midsection of the seat. Shit, he's staggering, said her mother from up front. She and her sisters, all ears and eyes then, their game, history, searched the suited up commuters to see how pronounced a stagger her mother was talking about. Well, girls, she continued, one hand holding her lit cigarette, the other slapping the back of the seat beside her, turning to them. He's plastered tonight, all right, giving her kids a look that said, we're in for it, girls. And they were. Sometime around midnight, wearing her PJs in tears of exhaustion, Laura leaned against a wall in her parents' bedroom. Weary and wrung out from hours of refereeing, detouring, and deflecting nasty, hurtful words and sentences spit from one parent's mouth to the other's, she pleaded, Daddy, please, you love Mommy, and Mommy loves you. Please, Daddy, go to bed. You both need rest. Begging, crying, she put her body in between theirs when they got too close. You go to bed. This isn't your business, young lady. Get to bed, said her father, wearing nothing but his boxers, skinny legs and all, wobbling around, working to maintain footing. Leave her alone, Mike, slurred her mother, not quite as drunk as he was, wiping spit from her mouth with the back of her hand. Her hair and eyes vied for first place as to which looked wilder. Leah's boat alone, you bastard, she said. Before the words were even fully slurred out, he hit her. Laura never saw it coming. The punch hit her mother in the left eye and cheekbone, flung her into the wall, sending them all reeling. She sat at her place at the bar, mute, not touching her Shirley Temple. She had a paper napkin in her hand and kept rubbing the bow of the ship with it silently, gently going over it and over it and over it again, speaking not a word to anyone. Rudy noticed the palpable silence and icicle air between her and her father. He asked, his eyes clear and kinder than she remembered noticing before, if she was okay. Doing all right there? You're looking a mite bit sad today, said Rudy, his protruding girth wrapped tightly in an immaculate white apron heaving out a sigh as he said it, manly-like, a big belly blacksmith or a grandfatherly shoemaker from the old country, or an Irish barkeep who'd pretty much seen it all. I'm okay, Rudy, she said unconvincingly, tracing the smooth wood. I won't be coming back here, so I'm saying goodbye to the ship. My heart was broken. I love my father, but then I hated him, is what she could have said, and he would have believed her. I see, was all Rudy said. She sat waiting for her father to down his drink with not a comment to share with anyone. Feeling sad to be giving up the ship and Rudy's, she wanted to hate them both as much as she hated her father. When he finished his drink, he dug into his pocket, pulled out some bills, and standing threw them on the bar. See you, Rudy, he called back heading toward the door, not even checking to see if his daughter was following him. Catch you later, Mike, said Rudy. Little Laura, 
he called out before she reached the door. Come here, miss, he said. And when she walked back to him, he picked up the ship and walked it around the bar to her. Take it, kid, he said. When she started to protest, he pushed the boat into her arms, turned her toward the door, whispering so no one else could hear. Take it, me darling. She's a sturdy one. Just like you. Spoken man. Chapter 5. The Blind Pony. That Christmas, Aunt Laura gave her a beautiful black velvet jewelry box with a strand of tiny white pearls inside. Laura took the pearls out and immediately put them on. But there was no present under the tree for her from Uncle Danny. Instead, he asked to talk with her privately in her grandfather's study. Laura's first thought was money. She thought perhaps he was giving her some and didn't want to do it in front of the other kids. Thinking in terms of several green bills, she followed him into the library. I couldn't fit your Christmas present under the tree this year, he said, putting his drink down without a coaster on the perfectly maintained, newly polished, well-aged mahogany coffee table. When his drink spilled, he continued unaware or unconcerned with what was happening to the table. I've been watching you over the last few summers, and I think you're becoming a good little writer. You deserve your own horse. Her uncle got right to the point. No finessing with how school are you having a good Christmas so far. Her mouth opened and she was about to ask him to repeat the last part of what he just said. She was also wondering how much he'd had to drink when he continued. Your Christmas present is the sweetest little pony. She's perfect for you. I'll drive her out in a week or two. You have plenty of room on your property, and it's about time you had a horse around. Uncle Danny hadn't made it into Fordham or Holy Cross like his brothers, nor did he give a flying fig. He ended up in some college for cowboys in Montana and tried his damnedest to become one. That about time you had a horse around was his feeble attempt at Hoss Cartwright from Bonanza. He talked about the pony like it was a done deal. Laura's heart raced. She hated all the holsters and cowboy gear, but loved riding in horses. The thought of her own pony was overwhelming. It was enough to forgive years of mistrust and disappointment. Laura jumped up and down, then caught her breath. Nothing that great was that easy. But what about my parents? What did they say? Oh, they'll be fine, he said, waving his meaty hand like he was shooing away a fly. Of course Uncle Danny hadn't cleared his gift with her parents first. His plan was to get her all worked up so they could attack as a team. Her father, for the most part, was no fan of Uncle Danny's. He thought him a bum, resented her mother for babying him, and endlessly revisited his fuck-ups. There was the time Uncle Danny bought an English car, an original Mini Cooper, dark green and in need of many parts and a new paint job that he left on their lawn for months with the intention of fixing it up, but never got around to. There was also the minor yet explosive matter of her mother lending Uncle Danny money to pay for polo ponies he bought on credit. Her grandfather refused to pay for them, and when her father found out that her mother footed the bill, He hit the roof. Laura's suspicion in later years was that his dislike was more about the food chain. Her Uncle Danny was more of a fuck-up than her father was, so turning around and pointing the finger at his wife's younger brother always gave him a boost. Go get your mother and let's talk to her first, Uncle Danny said, knowing full well he could sweet-talk her mom into most things. With her heart damn near racing out of her body and names of horses on her tongue, honey, sky, rocket, she ran into the living room, grabbed her mother's hand, paying no attention to her protests, and dragged her into the library. Well, Danny, that's a generous gift, her mom said, giving her brother a small, strange smile. Excitement was not what she was displaying. Nothing close. 
please, Mommy, please let me have it, please, Laura cried, trying to interrupt the negative thoughts she could almost hear in her mother's head. I'm so ready for a pony, please, Mommy. Calm down, honey. I know you're excited, but I can't say yes until I speak to your father. Her tone was gentle, and she kept it that way when she turned from Laura to her brother and said, Danny, I wish you'd run this by me first. Knowing full well her brother's strategy, loosen her up with a couple of Manhattans, then go to work on her. She wrapped up the discussion by saying she'd talk to Laura's dad during the following week if Laura promised not to nag her to death. She agreed, knowing that promise would be broken by the morning. True to her word, her mother brought up the subject of the pony the next night before dinner. Taking a cue from her brother, she waited until her father was loosened up before uttering a word about the four-legged gift. Of course, his father's response was a loud and not unexpected, No! You're as crazy as your no-good brother if you think I'm taking in one of his nags. The whole place will smell like horse shit, he shouted, ending round one. Not one to drop a subject if it pertained to something she wanted badly, Laura begged, cried, and carried on for the rest of Christmas vacation. She went ahead and told a few of her friends that her cowboy uncle gave her a pony. When school resumed, several asked if they could come by to see it. She explained the pony would be arriving any day and they could come over then. Her parents fought daily about the pony, which was no big deal since her parents fought daily anyway. The pony just replaced her mother's father and all his money as the headliner. Laura, after trashing her first promise in less than 24 hours, swore to new promises daily. She'd take care of the pony all by herself, feed it all by herself, clean its poop all by herself. She'd take care of everything all by herself. The words, no good bastard, were heard constantly around her house both about her Uncle Danny by her dad and by her mother in reference to her husband. On a Sunday afternoon, two weeks after Christmas, when Laura's parents were at an impasse and the answer she prayed for wasn't forthcoming, Uncle Danny showed up at their house, horse trailer in tow. Laura, outside on the front lawn making a snowman with her friend Irene, had been contemplating whether his hat should go on crooked or straight and if the two different colored button eyes worked when she spied a green station wagon desperately in need of a wash coming down the street with a trailer hitched behind it. Running into the house to tell her mother, who was sitting in her blue chair in the living room reading the Sunday paper, Laura unfortunately misjudged her father's position on the living room couch. Thinking he was asleep, stretched out as he was with a section of the paper over his face, Laura whispered too loudly that Uncle Danny and the unagreed-upon pony were slowly but surely working their way up the block. Lucy, three houses up the street on her friend Helen's front lawn, having bombarded her friend with snowballs, heard the commotion. At the sight of Uncle Danny's car and the horse trailer, she dropped her snowball on the street, yelling, The pony! and broke into a run. Come on, that's my uncle heading to my house, and there's going to be fireworks in January! She screamed back to Helen, running toward her house. My pony! My pony! And Laura was out the door and sprinting toward the trailer with Lucy and her friend and her mother right behind, Peggy bringing up the rear with her swearing father closing in on them. Uncle Danny labored to extricate himself from behind the wheel of his car and greeted Laura with a wide grin and then walked to the back of the trailer. Her father, thank God, missed one of the front steps in his rage and stumbled, giving her uncle time to unload the pony. Laura looked at the gift she'd obsessed over continuously for weeks, the gift she told her classmates and friends about many times the gift her parents had fought over since it was offered, and all she could utter was, oh. At the same time, icicle tears formed on her cheeks. Oh, no, followed by, Danny, how could you? Staring at the Shetland pony, wearing a big black patch where its right eye should have been, Laura's mother at once 
wanted to embrace her heartbroken daughter and slap her thoughtless brother. All she could do, though, was say, Oh, Danny, reach for Laura and shake her head. You get that broken down animal off my property right now, you son of a bitch, or I'm calling the cops. Get that fucking pony in your fat fucking ass off this street now, yelled her father in his fury. Coming toward them, brushing snow off his pants from his stumble, he continued to yell for the entire world to hear. A small crowd of neighbors had gathered, with Laura crying, her mother shaking her head sadly, and her sisters and the neighborhood girls gaping and bug-eyed. Take that pony and leave, said Laura's mother to her brother, voice low, sounding like a ship's captain with laryngitis. She'd never heard her mother sound like that with any of her brothers or sisters before. Uncle Danny packed up his pony with its one eye and pirate's patch and stuffed his swollen belly into his car. He was escorted up the block by Laura's dad, who raced alongside the trailer. Get that nag the hell out of here, you no-good son of a bitch! Off my block! You should be ashamed, you no-good bum! Watching him his long skinny legs working hard to catch up to the trailer. She knew whatever it looked like. Her father wasn't fighting for her or the real pony she'd been expecting. Not once did he acknowledge her disappointment. He was using that moment, her moment of utter loss and total embarrassment, to solidify his place in the food chain. That's all. He'd be tossing that blind nag at her mom for days, weeks, months to come. It was in his pocket to be pulled out whenever it was needed. Spoken Man. 